Hi there, welcome back to Palimpsest Live. This week we are going to bring you the interview that Cheryl had for the Talking to Artists podcast with Kate Taylor. Um, it's a lovely conversation, so I hope you enjoy that. Please uh, check out Kate uh, on Instagram. She's at Kate Taylor Art. And uh, if you enjoy this interview, please uh, give us a like or a comment. We always check everything. And if you have a question, you can always put that in the comments and we all try to answer that in an, uh, in an upcoming live. Uh, so without further ado, please enjoy the Cheryl's interview with the lovely Kate. Hello and welcome to Talking Darkness. I was going to say good morning because I always say good morning, but it's actually six o'clock in, uh, in Toronto time because we're going to be talking to an artist from Australia today and I didn't think it was fair to ask her to get up at two o'clock in the morning and have an interview. So just a couple of quick things. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you so, so much to everyone who came out to the Riverdale Art Walk this past weekend. It was awesome. Even though the weather was kind of windy, uh, it was so great to see so many people out. The artist community was super pumped and it was really, uh, really great to see everybody again. So thank you so much for that. Um, the other quick thing is, as you may have seen on my Instagram, I'm headlining the uh, Square Foot Show all about abstracts. So I'm really excited about that. We have 75 awesome artists who are participating with us. So that's going to be really great. Um, but I see that Cheryl has joined us, so I'm going to bring her right on and we can hear all about her cool stuff that she's working on. Oop, I put my glasses on. Cheryl. And hopefully the technology works, because that's always a challenge. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Hi, how are you? Well, thank you. Good, so I gather it's pretty bright and early for you in the morning, is it? Um, it's eight o'clock here. Um, I'm at my mother's place, which is Tamworth, um, and I'm at the back of her house. And I have just noticed that there's frost on the ground. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that seems kind of more of a Canadian thing somehow. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, it's funny because yesterday we had with the, uh, it was about 30, 38, 39 degrees in Toronto with the humidex, it was up to about 45. Which was just it would like, have killed ah. you. It would have killed you. <laughs> it almost did. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I anyway. remember um, we had a yeah. dreadful day. It was about forty-five degrees, and I had a just bought a new mini miner mini, and I was coming back from my mum's place, and we stopped in this park, and it normally has all of these flying foxes. Oh. Cool. And I kind of wanted to take a photograph. But there were people in the park and it was 46, 48 degrees and they were picking up oh, these poor animals that had expired. It was just dreadful. Oh, oh yeah, my goodness. Just, so just, and, and I just couldn't even take a picture of it. It was just so dreadful. No, yeah. that kind of ruins it. Yeah, it was just awful. It was anyway. I mean, yeah. I, and often when I hear those high temperatures, I always think, oh my God, those poor birds. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because we had, uh, my daughter did an exchange, so she spent two months in Sydney, and then we had an Australian girl come and stay with us, right? She's like, what was, what's with this Humidex thing? Like, the temperature's the temperature. I'm like, uh, no, not when you've got like 80% humidity, and it yeah. feels like 45, even though the actual temperature isn't. Yeah. And by the end, it was just like, yeah, okay, I get that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you're based in, normally in New South Wales, that's correct, is that um, correct? North of Oakland. Okay. Which is about right. an hour up from Sydney. Okay. All right. Yeah. Beautiful. And you're an oil painter, retired art teacher, but maybe you can talk about your journey because I love the fact that your first inspiration was ballerinas, horses, and seals. I'm like, the ballerinas and the horses I get, the seals are just a little unusual. I know. Um, <laughs> when I was a kid, I, I was going, um, well, to infant school or to, yeah, to infant school. And the Department of Education must have purchased these reproductions of the impressionist paintings and so these paintings went into every 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 school kids room and i just remember you know how you'd go to one room for music or you go to somewhere else for painting or craft or you'd move around these sort of classrooms yeah. and i just remember there was dagus's ballerinas uh i think there was cleese you know that um sinbad the sailor that was the seals Right. And I remember Franz Hals, those beautiful red horses, the fourths. Mm -hmm. And I always remember thinking, um, 
oh, it would be wonderful to paint like this and to feel like this. And I suppose, um, and that's where the memory started. But the funny thing is, is I went to my daughter's school huge amount of time later and they still had these really old faded reproductions on some of the walls they wow. have never thrown them away i'm guessing they're not quite as vibrant after what 30 <laughs> years or whatever as they would have been originally <laughs> yellow <laughs> yeah it's funny you say that because i remember um you know, doing art history again in the olden days where you had slides, right, of all the pieces. And you look at some of these pieces and you're like, yeah, okay, you got to memorize them and do the dates and stuff. And then I remember seeing them in the galleries and I'm like, oh my God, those slides were so old. They were so faded. It was almost pointless yeah. to even study the work because it's so different from the originals. Yeah. But when, um, back in those days, where I suppose in the 60s and the 70s, back in my time, um, I never really had access to colored photographs and even to have plates in books. And so that was really sort of special for me. And I remember um, a friend of the family, he purchased a Reader's Digest, great paintings of the art world when I was about 15. And to have plates that big and in colour. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the context of the time, we take it for granted now that we can just, um, you know, the internet's fabulous. <laughs> well, it is interesting, though, because I, I don't know about you, but I very rarely... Well, you're a real, more realistic painter than I am. I'm abstract. But I very rarely um, refer to photographs or anything when I'm painting. And I think some of that came from exactly your point, is that if I decided I wanted to paint an ocean wave, well, yeah. I'm landlocked. I'm in Toronto. I don't have ocean waves. So I either have to kind of completely make them up or I've got to go and find them in a book where someone has already painted them. And that kind of feels a bit like copying, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it, the role of photography and how much you use it? Yeah. yeah, I do a bit of both. Um, I, I do a lot of plein air and I go out and I sketch and then I come back in and I pretty much make it up too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the fun part, isn't it? Yeah. I always think, well, if you could reproduce it exactly, then why don't you just take a photograph? Right? Yeah. Like, the I mean, point is, I think, to put up. your mark on it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, sure. I the whole thing about life's all made up, you know, so I think yeah. I just make up my own. Well, and that's very true. And not only is it made up, but it's also your perception of what you're experiencing too, which yeah. I guess is part of the experience of producing the work and then part of yeah. the experience yeah. of someone looking at it. Yeah. yeah. And so how did you go from cool images that inspired you within um, obviously a very young, at a young age in the classroom to kind of becoming an artist then? Um, I always loved art, of course, going right through high school. I ended up becoming an art teacher. I was discouraged by so many people that being an artist doesn't pay the bills, yep. all those sorts of things. But I was, I, I think that there was a lot of, um, not a lot of support for much, um, <laughs> I don't know, for a female. Because I remember even when I went to art school and, and I got a degree and I remember being told that I could still scrub floors. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so I, I sort of grew up in that sort of, so yeah. And um, so I had a teaching career and when I retired, <coughs> I suppose we spent a few years in China when we came back, oh. um, early 50s. And after a few years, I just went back to life drawing. And yeah. um, I felt like I actually had the space then. And then I, um, so what I was doing was I was coming up here to see my mother and I'll walk around my mother's garden. My mother, this is winter. So remember oh. that there's nothing flowering, okay? So my mother <laughs> I wish my is... winter looked like that. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother is a prolific gardener. Oh. And so my mother has this, um, she had this incredible garden and it's always full of hollyhocks and roses and... Oh, beautiful. Wheelbarrow. Wonderful shapes too with some spiky things and... Oh like gosh, it's... everything and yeah. anything. Anyway. So I would come back and when I spent time with mum, I was actually drawing and painting her garden. So I ended up with my first exhibition of my mother's garden. Oh, that's so wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so sad though that, you know, so many people have such great talent and they're so, um, and I think women especially years ago are so um, encouraged not to do it. And that whole thing about, you know, not only are you never going to make any money, we're going to make sure when you go to school that you're going to have be, have all the stereotypes in your head so yeah. that you're almost guaranteed not to make any money, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a really, it's an interesting, um, it, it's really interesting. I do a little bit of teaching now, um, women my own age, and um, it's only been now for about six months that they've been coming. If my husband comes down to take some shots at the end of the lesson, they have only just stopped being apologetic. Yeah. And, yeah, and I keep sort of saying, um, you know, it's just a bit of oil paint. It'll come off with the <coughs> drips. Yeah. Um, you, you'll be fine. Let's just enjoy our time. It doesn't have to be worth anything. There are many things that we do in life that isn't worth anything. We listen to music. We read books. We spend time with other people. We never get paid for it. So why not just think of this like that? That's a really lovely philosophy, actually, because I, I think you're right. It's kind of like if I don't produce something that's perfect, somehow it's a waste of time versus exactly like you say, you know, I sit in the garden for two hours and watch the birds, right? <laughs> like I don't get anything specifically out of it except for a really deep-seated contentment. Yeah. So then I, so I ended up, um, okay, so, so having my first exhibition and then I needed to learn more about, I suppose, online marketing. So I actually met Stephanie, who you know, and mm -hmm. I met Stephanie whilst doing an online course, uh, The Profit Canvas. And what's come out of that is, is the International Art Alliance, which do you know about that from Stephanie? Yes, I do. That's why I'm interviewing all of you guys. And I yeah. think it's just yeah. fascinating. I'm just so excited to see what you guys come up with. Yeah. So but talk about um, it for people that maybe missed the previous episodes. <laughs> so there's six of us and we are working on the same painting and we are sending it around the world. And we have a Facebook Live at, um, now I've got to get these times right because I'm in your future. So Australian right. time, it is at 5.30 <coughs> in the morning, Friday. And I think it's for EST or Eastern Standard Time. It's at 3.30 um, in the afternoon, 3.30 p.m. And that's right. a Facebook Live that you can So anyone can on. join into that then? They can sort of come in and see what you're doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're actually just about to um, jump into our larger, our larger works. Yeah, and we're all it's, we're all finding all these excuses why <laughs> why we can't get them finished. Um, they well, end up it, going. It, yeah, I was just saying it's very interesting because I think you're about the fourth or fifth artist I've interviewed, and everyone's been really nervous about starting and about covering up someone else's work or kind of you know, like putting your own mark on something, but how much do you cover and especially stuff like that, except for Rose Williams who I interviewed last week. And she's like, oh, I'm really excited to just cover up stuff. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's good yeah. for you. You're yeah, bold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, I do a little bit more of that too. I always sort of think, oh my God, there's a white space. Oh, let's just fill it. <laughs> <laughs> and so what about your own work then? You it looks like you work in, um, you obviously do a lot of your coastline, which are beautiful um, waterscapes. Yep seascapes and then uh, florals with your water lilies and stuff. Um, yeah, I started doing the water lilies because of the, uh, the lockdowns um, and I was uncomfortable going down to the beach because I thought that somebody would rouse on me <laughs> for being yeah. out. And um, so I, I remembered that there was a water pond um, at, the, um, at the end of the oval and um uh sorry the sports oval and there was a mm -hmm. water pond there and it's the back end of the lagoon so the lagoon comes in from the beach and it comes up um the highway uh, well, the major main road goes underneath the road and it forms this brackish sort of lagoon and i remembered it it has lots of trees around it so i was starting to go down there and i would paint so nobody could see me <laughs> so you're like hiding in the trees painting the water lilies <laughs> yeah yeah that's awesome and that way nobody would you know, would have a go at me, like, how dare you be out and how dare you be doing this? <coughs> and was so it I started... So it sounds Sorry, like the, the, it sounds like some of the restrictions were pretty strict then during COVID then. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people were walking the beaches, but they weren't allowed to sort of stop and mingle. Right. Yeah, we were like that too, actually. Yeah, all the yeah. you couldn't sit on the benches. So I can see why plain air painting, obviously, you have to stay in one place. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started a water lily series. And that's how that got started. And I was just going down there and painting. And it's really quite, really tranquil. Whereas the beach is always windy. There's waves, there's water, there's stuff happening. There's, I don't know, it's just, it's um, a lot more difficult. Well, I find for me, it's a lot more difficult to paint at because there's all this stuff happening and people and I don't know, activity. Right. Well, I yeah. mean, just by the very nature of the waves, they change every single time you look at them, right? So yeah. 
I guess yeah. it's a different uh, it's a different kind of environment. Yeah. 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 I I don't. Yeah. Of course. Well, I don't. Maybe of course I don't do plein air painting because I haven't really quite figured out how to do the abstract plein air painting thing yet. But I know my sister does very much and you know, straps these big canvases on her back and hikes up there <laughs> with a three, wow. 36 inch panel on her back and then does these pretty awesome uh, plein air paintings. So she does it in acrylic? So she, she, lays, she lays it down, I think, in acrylic. Okay. She, no, she works in oil first. She must work in oil first. No. Yeah, acrylic first and then she does yeah. the oil over top. Yeah. 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 I was wondering how she'd get it down without oil. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure there are also some accidents too, probably, that were kind of, you know, like, uh -huh. maybe happy little accidents that changed the composition a bit. I don't know. Yeah, yeah ac accidentally dropped in the sand. <laughs> yeah, I've had a couple of those too. I don't know what I was doing, but I remember when I first started, because um, I work with a palette knife, and yeah. I don't know, I was just trying to do texture or whatever, and I don't even know what I was baking, and I grabbed these, like, I think they were like poppy seeds or whatever. And I was going to just add a few of them to see what it looked like. And they just went poof over the entire thing. And I'm like, okay, that's just way too much texture in one place. It looks like it's been <laughs> falling down, upside down onto the dirt or something. But yeah, that's yeah. part of the play. Yeah, yeah. And that's the nice thing about art, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It is. So what's it, your, it's... what's your favorite thing to paint? Like, I, I love, I, I, I just love the process. I love looking at, um, um, I love going off to the art gallery. I would love to live by the art gallery. I have a plan <laughs> to spend a month by every major art gallery in the world. Or oh, wow. pro pro probably I would need six months and just go there every day and draw and paint my favorite artists. Well, that yeah. concept of studying them. Yeah. So I'd love to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's, I, it's yeah. wonderful. It's, it's one of the things I just did uh, Chicago one of a kind and one of the things that I just loved too is the, going to the Chicago Art Institute and just, I don't know, just absorbing it. And of course, it was yeah. so nice to be out in real life again too, but it was just, you forget how inspirational it is to look at really beautiful works of yeah. art. And I love that concept of um, exploring the world as an artist, um, as a painter, promoting other people's work. But also I love, um, I just love how people think and I love how it all comes out in their art. And I love asking that question, like, what were you thinking or what's going on here? Or, and I, yeah. I, I just find that um, I, I, I love that. And I think that's why I love, um, I love the masters and I like going into the art gallery and I have favorite paintings and I love to sit, you know, I love to find them again when they're um, up. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. you know, as they rotate a major exhibition and um, yeah, it's always, um, I, yeah, I, I suppose I'm really fascinated how the brain works and um, how we come up with all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I love that too. And someone said to me the other day, I said, oh, you're a process painter. And at first I'm like, no, no, I'm a creative painter. And I'm like, no, actually kind of I am because I do love that the process of, um, of kind of processing the thought concept and the tactile nature of the work and the paint. And once it's done, I'm kind of like, okay, good. It can go away somewhere else now. Someone else can own it. Yeah, yeah. And there's so many different ways um, to paint and there's so many different ways to think about it. And I do that a lot with my, my students. You know, it depends on um, through, through what glasses you want to look at it, you know, in a historical sense or in an emotional sense or in a not object style or abstract. Or, and it's yeah. infinite and you never tap out. You never well, tap and, out. And especially with landscapes, you know, I mean, it's kind of like in Canada, you have the classic you know, birch trees and the, you know, the hills and the lakes and stuff like that. And yet you can have someone paint, you know, the same scene, but it's so different each time. The yeah. brush strokes are so different. And it's one of the reasons I love doing these interviews because you really get to talk to people who are technically painting the same thing, but look so dramatically different at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose like, being a teacher, um, I suppose a lot of the way that I taught, I could actually go through a program and I would show, my students for four or five different ways you can approach this subject if it was something like portraiture and i suppose it's been really hard for me to almost find my own style yeah because i'm so used to being in a teaching um trying to accommodate um the various um needs and wants of the kids the students well, I think when you're teaching, I've heard this from a number of artists too, is that when you're teaching, you're also very conscious of your mark making. You're conscious of what you're doing because you're trying to explain it so that someone yep. can learn from it, which is quite different, I think, from when you normally are painting for yourself. It's much more intuitive. That's a really good insight for me because I often feel that I can, um, yeah, 
I feel as if that teaching part, because I have done it for so long, yeah, is probably really, um, yeah, what I it's an Yeah, I find it interesting too because sometimes I do not, well, not since COVID really, but uh, I do this show where we were, you know, there's a couple of us artists and we're painting as the show is going on. And, you know, it's, it's quite fascinating to me that people sit and really watch you intently. I'm sure you find this with plain air too for like, you know, 20 minutes or half an hour. And then for me, they're like, well, why did you put that there? And why did you do that there? And, you know, especially when you're painting abstract where they, they don't have a structure for understanding why you're putting things in different places. It's interesting to have to force yourself also to kind of not justify it, but it kind of explain what the thought process was when it's so yeah. deeply subconscious. That's a really weird thing. And it's really hard to explain that, isn't it? Yeah. Because you don't, if you don't really know, um, yeah. And, and I make up stuff as I go along. And, um, and I get a feeling, and it's really interesting. I spend a fair bit of time with my elderly mum up here and I can't start a painting if I'm going to come up here for a few days because it's almost like the idea disappears down the rabbit hole and I can't get it out. I have yeah. to like get my idea, then get it down, work on it. But if I stop halfway, well, that's almost like one painting. That's, that, that's the painting already done. It's really weird. And then when I go back to it, it's almost like the ideas disappeared. It's like a snake or something, and it's and I can just see the tail disappearing, and I haven't grabbed it. <laughs> I, I totally get you. I think because I think it's about you know I talked a couple of weeks ago about being kind of in that zone, right? So when you're in the zone, it's like things are coming together, and you know where it's going to go, and you know what you have to do to the end of it, and you break that sort of zone trance, and you can't get back there. Like I, I'm the same way. I like to, I need to get a certain amount. Like I need to get like eighty percent of the composition done. And I can go in afterwards and kind of look at it and see if there's something that doesn't work, but I can't stop at 20%. It just, they sit here for like months because I never know about what to do to go back to them. Yeah. And that's like a student said to me something about, I have all these unfinished paintings and I found that really strange. I thought, how are they unfinished? They're a painting. Mm -hmm. Like unfinished? What does that mean? <laughs> Is it not just a painting? Why is it unfinished? And, and if they've been there for a long time, aren't they? I don't know. It was a really, and, and, yeah, I had to think about that for a while, like unfinished yeah. painting, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you go to art galleries and stuff, do you have like a favorite artist or do you look at different artists for different things, like for composition or for mark making or the way they do their water or? Um, I suppose I like um, down in the um, the New South Wales art gallery down here. They have a lot of the um, the impressionists, the plain air impressionists, which I love. They also have some of those huge paintings of battles, which are meters by meters mm. by meters. And oh, gosh, this was a French artist, Jerome something, Bastille, Bast something. And it was lovely to have a peek inside of his studio with all the. Uh, um, all the armory, all the beautiful bridles of the horses, um, all the wonderful spears and everything that he obviously had drawn in detail, a studio full of it coming together in this massive, massive mural. And so often I go back there and I, I just can't believe people have that sort of energy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, and also just how they how they visualize something so huge too. Like I find that like some of these big murals too, you're like, wow, it's just, it's not even just a creative process anymore. It's a huge technical process to try to figure out how do you execute it properly. And then I have another really sad painting and I, I, I visit it every so often and it's got this, you know, you know, the great big dog and he's, you know, the master has died and the dog's very silent and, <laughs> you know, that very sort of silent sort of, but yeah. I mean, that, that, that's always a really sort of sad one, but I, I don't know. I, I, um, I do like to go to mixed exhibitions, but I often find that I get really confused. I often prefer to go to one artist and um, mm -hmm. get involved. I find that when I go to the Archibald, which is a portrait prize, uh, there are so many different paintings and so many different artists. It does my head in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you start, to not be, you start to not be able to really see them properly anymore, I think. Like you're technically seeing them, but you're not really seeing them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it when um, the Art Gallery of Ontario here brings in these retrospectives. So you have, you know, Turner or whatever. And I wouldn't have particularly said that Turner was an artist I was that interested in. But it's so fascinating to watch when he first started, what the progression was. And I find by the end of it, you're like, oh, I love his work now. <laughs> you <know? Yep. laughs> because yep. you understand yep. more about it. I remember, I think it was in Vancouver, I was in a Monet 
um, massive exhibition of the Monet a few years ago and it was just magnificent. Yeah. Mind blowing yeah. and um and do you have like I know, you know, obviously in Canada with the group of seven is sort of like a religion <laughs> really for all artists in Canada. Do you have kind of um the same sort of thing in Australia where there's artists that have committed to capturing the Australian kind of landscape or vibe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um yes, we yeah, we, we would, yeah. We we have um Australia is really, really sunny. Um, <laughs> I lived in China for a long time and even with travelling, um, I don't know. I mean, if I sort of come out here in the sun, it's, <coughs> I mean. Beautiful. It, it's it's just really, um, our sky is really clear. And I, it's possibly because we don't have as many people living down here in the Southern Hemisphere. So what happens is, is that all of your air stays up where you are and you have the majority of the population. And I actually really, no I notice it when I go China well when I go to um, Canada the US I don't wear my sunglasses and the huh. thing is is that Australia is just so much more glary mm -hmm. it really is and um, I don't think other people really know that how glary Australia is because we don't have the huge amount of pollution and so we can see and um, we don't have as many particles in the air if that makes sense Right. I was also wondering if you don't have the same level of like, you know, obviously in Toronto too, that you have the 60 foot trees, which create a bit of a, a canopy that also seem to block some of that bright, bright light. Like obviously yeah. it would be different yeah. maybe in Saskatchewan or something, but yeah, 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 you do. Yeah. Um, so do, yeah, does your painting change? I'm sorry? so sorry. No, no, you go. A lot of desert painters. Um, yeah. However, we do not have the, um, the government support and just the support that you guys have and talking to my friends in the International Artist Alliance it's just incredible when you talk about how many galleries you have how many mm -hmm. places that you can apply to for grants or for help or it's just amazing we just do not have it I guess yep. we're spoiled <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great way to be spoiled. Well, um, yeah, it is. I think it's 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 good for a culture to have to embrace its culture and embrace its artists, right? And I think that yeah. you know, around the world, I think we could just do a better job of all of us remembering that and supporting the people that bring that creativity to the table. And even corporately, people are always talking about we want creativity, but they don't really understand the creative brain or how to work with creative people within a corporate environment, you know. No, you often, um, I've often seen ads for a chef. We want a creative chef. No, you don't. You want someone who is disciplined, who creates the same meal, blah, 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 who can work with groups. You don't want anyone who's creative. Yeah. You know, oh, I, 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 yeah, I learned that in the mutual fund industry because I would have all these creative ideas and they're like, oh my God, you're a space cadet. I'm like, what do you mean? Can't you follow my creative process here? <laughs> like, it just seems pretty <laughs> obvious. <laughs> so I learned, yeah, you learn how to communicate, you know. Yeah. So I don't, yeah. Yeah, that word creative, it's a really, it's an interesting concept. Yeah, how they, yeah, anyway. Yeah. And so do you find, talking about light, do you find that your work changes if you paint in, say, Vancouver or in China versus uh, in Australia? Yeah, I'm sure it would, yeah. Oh, I mean, China, you really couldn't see clouds, so the clouds were out and the sky wasn't blue, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, my son used to do tripping um, in Algonquin Park, and I remember he had a family came from China, and the boys were fascinated because it's the first time they'd seen blue sky. Yep. You're like, wow, that's that's a little bit yep. sad. Yep. But and they never get to see rainbows. No, yeah. And it actually tastes it tastes different. <coughs> so the air and where you are, it tastes different. And when I first arrived, we went up to this um to the top floor of the Capitol Club, which was the tallest building um in Beijing, and I couldn't see the footpath below. Wow. And it actually tastes funny. And so when I flew back into Sydney and I could get off at the airport in Sydney, the airport we're talking about, it still in the city. <laughs> it smelled better. <laughs> it was clear and bright. It was like, oh, it just tastes better. The air tastes better. <laughs> yeah. And there's just something about blue sky too. I don't know, like maybe because it grew up that way, but it's just like, to me, that's a happy day. <laughs> you know? It just doesn't seem right in sunshine. And they didn't have any like, bright sunshine because of because everything was diffused the sunlight was diffused mm -hmm. and well, it, maybe yeah. that explains a lot of the paintings too seem to be very monochromatic like especially some of the traditional why well, it doesn't make sense if it's traditional but i don't know yeah. there seems to be a different color palette for sure yeah 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 
And whereas I'm always seeing these huge dark shadows and these bright brights and everything's like, you know, the dark, dark shadow and the bright brights and all that sort of thing. So maybe, yeah. yeah, just my paintings tend to be fairly bright too. So it's very dramatic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because these huge sort of like brights and cause the sun's here and then the darks where the shadows are, the contrast is always sort of huge. Yep. Yeah. No, that's cool. I, I'd be interested. I wouldn't, I wonder if I would change my, well, I do know I change my color palette if I'm, doing a show in another country or a different region where those colors are not really as strong, but they're still, they're still pretty strong. So I guess, I don't know. Yeah. I'd have yeah, a hard yeah. time going monochromatic. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. And so you're, I think that from a reading your website that you started your own gallery just before it was just before COVID. Yeah, I, I renovated part of my house. <laughs> Actually, that was father, good timing. He passed on and he was always, um, he was a beekeeper and he was an electrical engineer, but he became a beekeeper. Oh, and cool. um, Terry loved to build things and he um, felled the timber for the floor and he built things. And um, so this was the bottom floor of the house and the sun was down there. And so we convinced him to leave. <laughs> and it's about the size of a two bedroom flat. And um, so we put a new flooring in and a little kitchen and just the way that I wanted it and lighting and so that we could have events and have um, uh, workshops and my sort of studio. And I often think that Terry would like that because I could imagine that he would enjoy um, people um, making things and doing things and enjoying you know, collecting stuff and craftsperson and, you know, he'd love all that. So yeah. I often think that, um, I often think about him. I think, yep, you know, um, <laughs> it was a good way to spend your, you know, your money, Terry. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that, that's a lovely, um, I don't know, tribute to him. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, you, so, you um, do clap. We've had a few, we have a few yeah. nights. We've only had a few nights because of COVID and I've, I've sort of forgotten how to, how to live in a way since COVID. I've forgotten that we can do all these things. I know, it but feels I've had weird. A few students have worked there and we have, um, yeah, yeah, some little classes and, um, <coughs> but it's nice to so. have a large space, a large comfortable space. And so is that your painting studio as well? Or is that just yeah. your gallery space? Um, yeah, um, so I have one of the bedrooms is my painting studio. Then I've got a storeroom and then I've got a large open space. I think it's about a hundred, Hundred square uh, meters, a hundred square feet. I don't know. About about a two bedroom unit. Uh, oh, flat. nice. Yeah. And is it open to the public so people can kind of come in and look at the work, or is it invitation um, only? Or? Or appointments. And sometimes I'll do a one off um, um, Saturday or Sunday or uh, weekend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That sounds great. Well, I guess as, as things are starting to come back to normal too, that's going to potentially change the way that you kind of manage that space. I guess. Yeah, and I hadn't really um, thought about it um, for a while because of this COVID thing. I'd, I'd sort of closed down a bit in my mind, thinking yeah. that I'd do these sorts of things. But well, now I'm going to get back into that. It is definitely different because I just we just I just did an outdoor show with 150 artists, and it was really busy, and the weather was gorgeous and stuff like that. But it, on one hand, it just felt a bit weird like almost like this low-grade anxiety before we started and then as we're in the middle of it it's just like oh it feels normal again for the first time in two years i feel like life is kind of back to the way it should be isn't that great yeah we had one of those also at the surf club and it was just amazing and people were walking along and they were coming in and everybody had that feeling of oh my god we can actually be close to people. It yeah, we so can talk about our art. We can look at it non-digitally. <laughs> yeah, and isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful that art can do those sorts of things? And um, I always, I'm, I'm always, um, I always love um, how um, people will travel the world to see a piece of art and everybody will have a comment about the Mona Lisa or they've been to a particular art gallery and, yeah. and, and, and I seen this and these people don't even know anything about, I mean, I mean they're not necessarily into art, but they'll travel the world just to, yep. just to go to an art gallery. Well, you see, that I remember seeing those kind of people in the uh, Fuzzi Gallery, you know, which is, of course, is so yep. huge in Florence. And uh, people are just like going so fast. It's like, done that one, seen that one, seen that one, seen that one. And you're like, yeah, but you're not really seeing it. You're not really absorbing <laughs> it. You're not really celebrating the beauty of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it. But I guess to each his own. I guess at least they saw it. Yeah, Some people haven't even seen it. Some people don't even spend the time going in. So I guess maybe we should be grateful for that. 
<laughs> yeah. So what's, uh, what's next for you? I've got an exhibition coming up um, at a local gallery, at the Gosford Gallery um, in the community centre, and that's um, early in August. And I think it goes from about the 7th to about the 14th. So I've got to get prepared for that and get my head around that. So that, that's the next um, bit. And I'm hoping to get a book for myself of my play Ooh. things of um, the local area, um, getting that together for the rest of the year or, yeah, that'll be a bit of a project. Yeah. That sounds pretty fascinating though. So is that a combination of exploring the space and then having the paintings that represents that sort of that space, almost yeah. like a tour of the a neighborhood? Yeah, 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 yeah. One painting, one page, details, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. And I don't necessarily, I don't have to publish it. You know, I mean, that's, that's fine. Just for me. See how I go with it. Like, you know, just starting the steps. Mm -hmm. yeah. I actually had my painting scanned, um, scanned with a flatbed scanner. I had six of them done. And I'm thinking about prints, but I'm, I don't know. I don't know about prints. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's funny because I just went to uh, visit a friend of mine's place in, uh, in Hamilton and she has a pretty large print process and she sells a lot of prints and you know it's pretty awesome to kind of just be able to see these huge you know seven foot by eight foot prints on the wall and there's something about that you kind of go yeah I can never paint that big because I paint on panel so it's just wow. way too heavy yeah but uh yeah I don't yeah. know it's neat that it completely surrounds you you know in a way that an actual painting can't do but I almost feel like I don't have enough space for it I have enough space to do my own painting and to do a bit of marketing I just don't feel like I've got the the brain yeah. path it just seems too much for me <laughs> for me <laughs> you, you, need, you need to find someone who'll do it for you <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> that whole outsourcing the stuff that, that uh, you don't necessarily want to do but you know you probably should from a business point of view <laughs> <laughs> and do you uh, do you sell digitally like do you sell online or how do you use your social media um, and your digital presence um i do have a website but oh, i'm just trying to get out of this sun i do have a website um, I seem to sort of sell more on Blue Thumb, which, a, which is a, um, a commercial type website. Oh. And I don't know, for some reason, if I, I, I just seem to have more hits on there. <laughs> and I'm not so really is, that, is that like an art aggregator site or I haven't I think, heard of Blue Thumb? Yeah, I think so. So there's many, many artists on it and I seem to just get more hits and people buy my paintings. That seems to be the biggest source. Plus in person. Mm -hmm. I've worked out that people seem to be... Um, um, they've got used to me now. <laughs> <laughs> Why are, are you weird and quirky and they had to get used to you? <laughs> they have to get used to you or they, they have to know you? Yeah. Well, I think certainly it helps. I mean, I, I find too, I'm happy to do the outdoor shows because I think yeah. you can build a personal authentic connection with people that are just, it's harder to do online for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's sort of happening with me anyway. That's, yeah, just starting. I had um, somebody come into the art walk. She said to her husband, well, which one do you want? And, uh, and he said, oh, I don't mind. And he just paid me. There you go. <laughs> well, that's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. Said something. He said, um, um, you missed out last time I went to Cheryl's Works. You better get it now. There you go. And I thought, wow, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. But that's, it's, you know, it's off, It's funny how often that happens too, where people will see a work at an outdoor show or something and they'll contact you, I don't know, four or five months later. It's like, oh, I'm ready to buy that piece. I'm like, yeah, it's gone. Like, you know, the stuff doesn't hang around for months, right? The whole point is to sell it and get it out the door. Yeah, yeah. Well, that sounds awesome. Yeah, it's lovely. Well, to yeah, it's been lovely talking to you too. I've really appreciated it. I love the rambling kind of, regardless of kind of interesting stuff. Yeah. And uh, I'm so excited to see uh, what you guys come up with with your collaboration because I think that's just a very brave and fascinating process you guys are doing there. It is, isn't it? So I might see you um, next year in person. Oh, awesome. So you're coming to Toronto, are you? Well, if the show is over in Toronto, I'll be over there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, well, I hope it is then because I would really love to see it. I just yeah. think I love the whole idea, the concept of that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you getting up early in the morning with the frost on the ground to, uh, to talk to me. <laughs> and Thanks. next week, we're interviewing uh, Julie Brayton, who is another one of Lovely. your uh, Artist Lovely. Alliance artists. Thank so I'm looking so forward much. to that, and too. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. All right.
Alrighty, I hope you enjoyed that wonderful interview. Um, as I said before, if you like this, you can follow uh, at Kate Taylor on Instagram where she does more of these. And of course, as always, um, you can follow us, uh, each of us on Facebook and of course on YouTube as well. We are in the International Art Alliance. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure to type them in the comments and give us a nice like because we like those things. Um, next week, we'll be back with the group to look at some more paintings, how they are developing. It's really exciting. We are now that we're at the end of our um, test pieces, uh, they're, they're really becoming their own little entities. So it's really exciting to get to open uh, a couple more uh, of those envelopes and see how they are developing. So make sure you tune in next Thursday at uh, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and when we will be back with the whole group. Thank you very much for watching and see you next week. Bye!